Hello, my name's Laserpig, and you're watching my YouTube channel for some reason. Uh, first, I'm gonna be completely honest, I am very drunk, and I'm not sorry for it. I'm Laserpig, and welcome to Pig Rants! Uh, I ran at the camera for a bit, that's, that's the extent as the magic goes. Ooh. Now this is a reaction to a live stream that happened uh, maybe about a day ago now on the channel Gonzala Lira 2 or maybe Gonzala Lira 11. I, I don't know. Uh, and it featured uh, such such um, wonderful minds such as history legends, uh, the new Atlantis, and one particularly notorious Twitter user by the name of Armchair Warlord who has become synonymous with his uh, with, uh, with the, his persistent denial of Russian war crimes in the current Ukraine conflict, uh, in spite of much evidence to the contrary. And, you know, as, as, as he said, while I was studying genocide, he was studying the blade. Um, okay, no. Uh, I, I, this is not a bully stream. I'm not, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna bully these people. Just so before I begin, I want to remind you, do not harass these people. I brought up the podcast, Well, There's Your Problem, in a recent video of mine. I, I, it's a podcast I love. I listen to it all the time. I would love to be a guest on there, but they won't ask me, and that makes me very sad. I, I was very disappointed, and I mentioned them, to see a lot of sudden hate comments in their channel referencing me. Don't do that. That's naughty. I'm very disappointed in all of you who did that. All seven of you. How dare you? Bad. Naughty. Who sit in the corner and think about what you did. Someone being wrong on the internet does not give you the right to go and harass them. And do, please, keep in mind, this is a developing situation in Ukraine. There's a lot of propaganda on both sides, a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos. Yes, I do believe that these four individuals are incorrect about a lot of the things that they're going to say in this two-hour-long podcast. <laughs> oh, God. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna address the points that they bring up, because I think they do deserve to be um, addressed in a, in a civilized manner, but I am not egotistical enough to believe that I am omnipotent. I do make mistakes, I am occasionally wrong, and let's keep in mind you are occasionally wrong. And basing your opinion on what a YouTuber tells you is really kind of a bad way to live your life. Ah, uh, so, this is the first time I've ever done a reaction video. They do seem quite popular. And a lot of people wanted me to do this. So, by the ancient traditional rituals of reaction content, I hereby declare, let's get right into it. Hello, this is Gonzalo Lira speaking to you live. And this is the round table. This is the round table number three. And I'm joined today by Armchair Warlord, History Legends, and the New Atlas. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, uh, the situation in Ukraine and the geopolitical situation around the globe generally. Anyway, let me give a quick introduction to each of my uh, guests. They are each of them uh, very uh, uh, big deals in the commentary community. First of all, there's Armchair Warlord, Tyler who has a, um, a Twitter feed that is the go-to place insofar as uh, everything military that's going on. He served 11 years as a commissioned officer with the United States Army. Uh, he was an artillery man. Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong. So one thing I always notice, especially in podcasts like this, when they get on, when they bring on a military expert who has actually been in the military, they're always a military expert because they've been in the military. No, not for any other reason. Uh, I, I, I notice this a lot. You'll actually notice uh, when officers, former officers do this, they always start by stating their ranks. Uh, Non-officers tend to state how long they were actually in the army. They never state their expertise. Because they don't fucking have any. I, I, I mean, you never get this with any other podcast, do you? I can critique Gordon Ramsay's food. I was a line chef at Arby's. That's chefing. That's the same thing. Fuck. Just because you were in the army does not make you an expert in war. I mean, if one of these people turn out to be a former commander of the Russian army, fuck, I'm all ears. I want to hear what that person has to say. But I'm going to bet you 20 bucks that none of them are. In fact, I, I will put actual money. Where's my fucking wallet? Actual money on the fucking table. Ow. 
<laughs> Bet you 20 bucks one of these fuckers is former Marines. Don't know which one. I just know it's coming. And um, yeah, he, so, so this war that's going on in Ukraine is his kind of war. You know, screw this airplane stuff and this drones and whatnot. No, artillery, the god of war. Yeah, screw planes and all that fancy shit. When did they ever win a war? It's always been artillery. Fuck me. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm almost ready to agree here. We have kind of gone back to a period of almost World War One style warfare, where we have two sides firing artillery cannons at each other while digging in trenches and then, and then claiming that they won because they managed to capture slightly more land that day than anyone else. This is the amount of land we've recaptured since yesterday. The actual amount of land retaken is... Excuse me, sir. 17 square feet, sir. <laughs> Excellent. So you see, young Blackadder didn't die horribly in vain after all. But the reason that we've kind of gone back to this kind of artillery war is largely because of deficiencies in both Ukraine and Russian tactics. Russia failed to establish air superiority because of their lack of sea training, their ineffective EW, that's electronic warfare, radar jamming and shit, uh, equipment, and in general relying too heavily on dumb fire rockets and cannon fire to destroy ground targets, which just didn't work. We're not in this situation, because tanks and drones and aircraft don't work. If Russia had air superiority, they would have won this war months ago, and we would have already forgotten it and moved on to which celebrity has been caught in a hotel room with 400 pounds of coke and 200 pounds of prostitutes. I mean, I mean, to give you the basic overlay, Russia has really kind of boosted its anti-air defenses around its forward operating areas that it's, that's really hindered the Ukrainians' ability to strike at these artillery positions with their drones and aircraft, and they just don't have that kind of long-range firepower needed to compete with, you know, heavy Russian artillery. Prior to that, when the Russian anti-air systems were still a fucking mess, drones and aircraft were absolutely demolishing them. The Russians lost about 800 artillery pieces within the first few fucking months of the war. So much so, they're having to dig out the old 152mm cannons out of storage. Some of these guns date from the 19 fucking 20s. And they're only using them because Ukraine doesn't really have anything strong enough to counter them. It, but, you know, those kind of tactics do have their downside. Russia is firing nearly 6 thousand shells into Ukraine each and every day. That's a huge production requirement. It's a huge storage requirement. And we've seen Ukraine shift tactics from the destruction of these artillery units to ammo storage. And it's, it's working surprisingly well for them. I, I mean, secondary fronts in Russia, especially non-Russian units, which, you know, don't get priority, like the Chechen commandos, like the DNR, like the Libyan volunteers, etc., all complaining they are running out of ammo. Plus, NASA heat maps of Ukraine have shown that the number of Russian artillery strikes have halved, and then halved again. It's because they, they just don't have the ammo supply to just to keep up 6,000 shells fucking day. And that is exactly what Ukraine wants. That's exactly what it's doing. It's, it's depleting Russian artillery ammunition stocks so when they do counterattack, Russia can't just go, fuck you, heavy artillery. Uwu notices your counterattack. Heavy artillery. I hate myself. That was awful. Ignore that. I never said that. And Tyler is our man in that regard. Then we have the History Legends channel, uh, which is an up-and-coming channel that, that's uh, run by Alex. Alex is just a master insofar as making history interesting to his viewers, and that's why his channel has had explosive growth, and his analysis is right on the money. Um, <laughs> I debate that. I mean, I mean, I'm not a hundred percent familiar with this guy, but I have watched a few of his videos, and he has made several rather false and misleading claims, such as claiming that the the Hemras unit was, was was costing like four hundred million per unit. It's not. It costs about six to eight million, and that like nearly ten thousand Ukrainian troops were dying every week, or I, I think he put it like a thousand a day, which is outrageous. It's about. I mean, even fucking. Russia today said it was about a hundred a day. It's, it's not a fucking... Mm. But, I don't know him that well. Uh, he has 
when he is proven to have made a mistake, he does tend to say, yeah, yeah, I made a mistake. Sorry, guys. He's, he puts his hand up to that. that. That's that's a very rare thing. You you don't get often get people who do that in these kind of circles. They usually just double down and go, no, you're wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> Christ, this wine. Oh, God, I shouldn't have drunk so much. Oh, it's beautiful. Beautiful, gorgeous. Um, Pinot Noir. 2014 Chilean, Chilean red wine is is absolutely gorgeous. I also apologize, I need a new chair. This, this chair is fucked, it's creaking really badly. What was I saying? Oh yeah, no, 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 okay, so yeah, history legends, you know what, I'm prepared to give him the benefit of the doubt. Let's, let's, let's not judge, let's reserve our judgment. Let's see what kind of analysis he can come up with here. Cause I'm, I'm expecting, especially from this guy, I am expecting um, big things. I'm expecting like really good professionally sat down, really looked at the evidence, really kind of thought about it, kind of analysis. 20 quid, I'm disappointed. So it's a real pleasure to have you on Alex. Thanks so much. And finally, the great and only, uh, the one and only rather, uh, Brian Berlitich. Is, is that Berlitich, is that correct? Actually, you could say that or Berletic because it, it's Croatian. And so mm -hmm. I, I guess you could say it either way. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. He runs the New Atlas Channel. Uh, he also has a military background. He was in the United States Marine Corps. <laughs> 20 bucks from each of you. Thank you very much. And uh, he, after the Corps, he moved to Asia where he slowly started making a name for himself with his geopolitical commentary. A former U.S. Marine that's moved to Asia and does geopolitical commentary. <laughs> there are so many jokes I could make right now. <laughs> But, but you know, this this is not a Billy stream. We're, we're not here to bully these people. Um, we're we're here to judge what they say, not who they are. And you know, we're I'm like <laughs> ten minutes in now, and we're barely past the <laughs> we're not even past the introduction yet. <laughs> this is ridiculous. We're gonna be here all night. Uh, get yourself a cup of coffee or something, cause this is gonna be a long one. Uh, let's let's um let's skip ahead a bit. I'm gonna open another bottle of wine. Against my better judgment. We're going to be discussing uh, the situation in Ukraine. And I just wanted to kick off this conversation with what Sergei Lavrov said in this very interesting interview that he gave to RT. It was an incredibly long interview. Okay, starting your podcast by quoting Russia Today is maybe not the best move. It kind of, it kind of hints that, uh, it maybe hints that you're being somewhat selective with your sources here. Uh... <laughs> Sergei Lavrov, for those of you who don't know, is the Russian uh, foreign minister who uh, is famous, well, before this, was famous for uh, attempting to disrupt peace talks between uh, North Korea and the US, claiming that North Korea uh, would be better off being part of China. He was also interviewed on the 21st of February, saying that Russia's intentions were completely peaceful and there would be no war. And he likened Ukraine choosing its own official language as Ukrainian and not Russian as an act of genocide. Maybe... I, I, I'm going on a limb here. Um, not particularly the best source to be quoting right now, if I'm completely honest in my very, very drunk opinion. Um, and he basically, and I'll start with you, Brian, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he seemed to be saying that all the territory that Russia has captured, it's going gonna, it's gonna to remain Russian permanently. Is that an accurate assessment of what Lavrov said? Yeah, and I, I don't think there's any reason for anyone to have thought otherwise. I think everyone following this kind of understood that that, that was what was going to happen. I mean, honestly, yeah, I agree. I mean, apart from the fact that Russia, you know, right at the start of this claimed that uh, they were there to honor the democratic will of the people of Ukraine and these places, they would respect the independence and the autonomy of these regions. But as we all know, Russia lies through its fucking asshole, so no one fucking believed them, apart from the two armies fighting for the independence of those breakup states. Especially the DNR, who seemed under the full delusion that they could somehow remain independent after asking Russia for help. <laughs> Historically speaking... <laughs> 
Uh, so there's been a lot of response from them. They actually made a video they sent directly to Putin, you know, just asking what the hell. Uh, these guys were incorporated into the Russian... 8th Army? I think it's the 8th Army. Uh, they've been on the front lines the entire war. They are running out of ammunition. Uh, they're running out of guns. Uh, images of them using civilian trucks, uh, garbage trucks, uh, what was it, like gypsy vehicles, um, old Second World War boat action rifles, fucking swords. <laughs> you know, have, have been, you know, going viral on the internet, you know, because they don't have guns, they don't have ammunition, they, they, they have very little food, they, they're completely out of medicine now, and they have received almost no supply from Russia. And now it turns out that the entire cause they are fighting for is already lost. So, apparently, they now do have major problems with drug and alcohol abuse, uh, huge problems with desertion as well. They started the war with 2,500 troops? Uh, that went up to 2,800, possibly 3,000, don't know, uh, it's unconfirmed, and they now have roughly 800 left. I, I really don't see them lasting for much longer, do you? Uh, they're not going to give any of that territory back, and as a matter of fact, they're probably going to uh, focus on taking additional territory. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have been seeing them kind of aimed at Nikolaev and Odessa this whole time. Uh, you, you know, they want to go further west, past Donbass, and, and now because of the, the long-range weapons the West is supplying them, I mean, you, you have to think their goal, their ultimate goal is to secure the Donbass region. How I, I dispute that because they've changed their mind on what their overall goal for this operation is several times, but I'm going to just let him keep talking because he's making a very excellent point, and I'll get back to it later. You have to think they're goal their ultimate goal is to secure the donbas region how can you do that if they've got these long-range weapons firing into the donbas region so they'll that is an excellent point i'll just reiterate what he just said how can russia secure the donbas region if ukraine has these long-range weapons that are able to fire into it or, to put it in a better way, how can Russia secure any of the territory it has captured if Ukrainians still have the capability and the will to fight? They've not realized it yet, but that one line has utterly destroyed almost all of the arguments they are about to try and make. I'm not going to explain it right now, but I want you to keep that in the back of your mind because I'm going to bring it up again. But I do honestly agree with uh, the rest of what he is saying here. Th they will keep pushing west. They will keep pushing west until all of Ukraine is under their control. We know this because Alexander Lushenko, the president of Belarus, leaked the full invasion plans at the end of February in a live fucking press conference, which included the future invasion plans of Moldova. Did you forget about that? Because I didn't. I remembered. They'll just keep pushing west, I think, until Ukraine is fully demilitarized. That's what I, that's at least what I think. Yeah, Tyler, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it makes perfect sense. I mean, the, I mean, there's sort of an unstated secondary objective, I think, uh, with this, uh, with this operation that they're, they're also going to be keeping uh, the security of Russia itself in mind. That was some, something that people talked about was, well, um, I mean, Ukraine is, the, the Ukraine border is quite close to even Moscow. I think it's only uh, 700 kilometers. And... I mean, if there's a, a specter of Ukraine being you know, heavily armed with long-range weapons and potentially being able to fire uh, fire weapons deep into Russia itself, and they're, the Russians are going to do something about this. Um, do you think Ukraine didn't already have the capability to do that? Because, uh, they kind of did. And the fear that they might, and that might cause, like, a bigger escalation, has kind of been the reason why the US has only been giving the Ukrainians short-range missiles. Specifically so they can't fire deep into Russian territory, which is why uh, Belgorod has really kind of been the only target for Ukrainian revenge attacks. I also like how he says Russia might do something, but then doesn't really go on to elaborate what it would do. I mean, you maybe give us some insight, give us some examples. What, what, what would they do here? What, what, what can they do to prevent Ukraine, apart from 
from, you know, just, just pushing further and further and further west, what can they do to stop these long-range missiles hitting Russian territory? Because as, as, as far as we've seen, uh, Russian anti-air defenses have had a really hard time shooting them down. The so-called superior Russian S-400 anti-air system that can apparently uh, detect and shoot down an F-35 is having trouble detecting and shooting down these really cheap drones bought on Amazon with, like, C4 strapped to them. Yeah, because, you know, they keep talking about these HIMAR weapons. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I read some wag somewhere on Twitter say, you know, HIMARS by Mars, and, you know, because the Russians have been destroying a bunch of them. The last count I heard was that they had destroyed and or captured four of them. All right, let's look at the evidence that the Russians gave for those four destroyed HIMARS. Ooh, pretty conclusive there. I mean, a, a shot of some buildings, uh, a small explosion in the dark. <laughs> Can't get any clearer than that. <laughs> but thankfully, we did get a clearer image. They produced drone image of a um, MRS system on fire, which later turned out to be from the video game Command and Conquer Tiberian Sun. And then when this was pointed out that that was obviously fake, we got this image, which looks like a HIMARS but isn't. What these boys have probably forgotten, as has Russian propaganda, is that the HIMARS is not a standalone vehicle. It's part of a family of trucks called the FM TV series, of which over a hundred have been given to Ukraine. And every time Russia destroys one, they claim it's a HIMARS. Which is what this is. It's not a HIMARS. It's a truck. Let me just reiterate that for the people at the back who weren't paying attention. Russian propaganda fucking lies all the fucking time. It is easier to find a single piece of straw in an entire pile of needles than find the fucking truth in a Russian propaganda website. This alone is kind of showing that these four fuckers are taking their sources from Russia today, from Sputnik, from pro-Russian Twitter users. <laughs> from fucking Russian propaganda. And that, that's, that's like coming to me and saying, yeah, Trump's gonna be made super president for life in the US. Fox News told me so. It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, what? <laughs> let's, let's continue. Let's, let's, it's not a Billy stream. Let's continue. Let's see what they say. Where's that fucking bottle of wine? I need it. Hey, and I, don't know if it's a rumor or if it's true that the United States is talking about sending 20 more. Uh, Alex, what do you know about that? Yeah, what um, I think about the U.S. in general is that they like to solve problems in the past 70 years using technology. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. I had such high hopes for this guy. Please don't tell me he's a fucking Pierre Spray fan. Oh, don't tell me we're about to get a fucking lecture and no, we don't need advanced technology to win wars. <laughs> you know, the thing that gets disapproved every fucking time for the past 200 years. Not a Billy stream. Like, just send more ammo, more money to solve any problem. This is what we've witnessed in Afghanistan, Iraq, Vietnam. It's always the same thing, right? So adding these weapons is an annoyance to the Russians for sure, because the Russians have been talking about it a lot. It it does annoy them, their supply lines and everything, but weapons alone don't win wars. Weapons alone don't win wars. Weapons alone don't win wars. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. There's an element of truth into that. A, a round of applause, well done. Well done, you've said a th sensible thing. Lots of factors go into winning a war, not just weapons. When the British invaded Zulu country and used heavy Gatling guns to basically mow down the entire Zulu army to the point where we now refer to the battle as a massacre, was it the tactics or the weapons that won that war? When the Emperor of Japan finally rebelled against Shogun rule and declared war on the samurai, was it the tactics or the weapons that won that war? When the invention of the machine gun turned early mobile warfare tactics of the First World War into a four-year trench warfare stalemate, was it the weapons or the tactics that caused that? 
When Japan proclaimed at the end of World War II that it would fight to the last, was it the tactics or the weapons which caused them to change their mind? Think on that. Like, there's, there needs to be a structure of the army, an organization, in order to win battles. Like, weapons is just a bonus. Are, are, are you suggesting that the Ukrainian and the US army don't have a structure? What? There's two people who served in the US Army right in fuck in front of you, and you're gonna claim the US Army doesn't have a structure? What? Is, what? Uh, Brian, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. How could you agree with that? How, how could you agree with the suggestion that the U.S. Army is just a bunch of money and weapons and has no structure? You were part of the structure! You were in the Marines! What is wrong with you? I, I was just uh, reading the transcript for a, a Pentagon briefing from yesterday, and they, I, I forget who said it because it was Secretary Austin and General Milley. They were both at this, this briefing. And one of them said, you know, the High Mars isn't going to win or lose the war. It's part of, a, you know, it has to be integrated into everything else. And this is something that I've been trying to get across to people, you know, who are pinning their hopes on all these wonder weapons. Do you not know how war works? Okay, you are right. The High Mars alone is not going to win Ukraine the war. But it is going to stop them from losing. The High Mars is not a fucking wonder weapon. It's a weapon! It's just a regular weapon! It has a purpose and a role on the battlefield! It's not a fucking Death Star! Okay, let me explain. Remember back when he said this? You have to think, their goal, their ultimate goal is to secure the Donbas region. How can you do that if they've got these long-range weapons firing into the Donbas region? So they'll- Russia, right now, has the capability to say, hey, we've captured Donbass, we've won. Force Zelensky to the negotiating table and offer terms that is favorable to Russia. Meanwhile, your troops get to rest, they get to rearm, you get time to train up new recruits, build supplies, and when you're finally tired of playing diplomat, you can continue to push into the West. Because Zelensky is being unreasonable and NATO just want blood, blah, 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 blah. That is the current Russian plan of action. They can hide behind their mass amounts of artillery, so anytime Ukraine counterattacks, they just go, fuck you, boom. Because Ukraine doesn't have an answer to that. They don't have mass amounts of heavy artillery that can perform counter battery operations without themselves being counter batteried. Until now. Because what the Himars do is take that Russian plan and fuck it into a fine paste. Not only can these weapons fire and move much, much faster than regular artillery, they can fire outside the range of Russian artillery. That means they can hit ammo dumps, railway lines, highways, bridges. They can fuck up Russian logistics, which are already fragile enough, and they can heavily demoralize troops on the Russian side, who now have to take these nightly attacks. That wears you down. A rocket attack is a fucking terrifying thing to be caught in. And what all of this is doing Doing is weakening Russia's ability to fight and its ability to hold the territory it's taken, which has been Ukraine's plan from day one. And it's fucking working. Right now, as you're watching this, Ukraine has been on a series of major counter-offensives around Kherson, in which Russia has simply been unable to deploy its heavy artillery units to stop. Russia's own offensives, which were supposed to have kicked into overdrive on the 14th, have basically ground to a halt, as the lack of ammo and the lack of supplies have forced these heavy artillery units into smaller and smaller areas of operation, because Russia simply cannot supply the entire higher line, so it now has to pick and choose between defending this area, defending that area, or continuing its offensive. And that is the power of the Himras. Yes, it, it won't win the war by itself, but it can, and has, negated Russia's biggest advantage. The, the High Mars, the M777, all of this, this was all designed with combined arms operations in mind. You cannot just have a High Mars system on the battlefield by itself. Yes, you can! Yes, 
you absolutely can! This isn't World War II amateur explanation hours! Oh, it's all about combined arms and how silly everybody else was to not know this. Do you not understand the difference between tactical and strategical warfare? Battle, they're sending these weapons that were designed and you know they were they were supposed to be doing combined arms operations uh, with you know with the US military not not Ukraine's military in its simplest terms tactical warfare is what you do in battle strategical warfare is what you do in a war if you're bombing a factory to support the war effort that is strategy, not tactics, technically. Just because you're operating under the doctrine of combined arms warfare doesn't mean all the elements of this combined arms need to present themselves every time you do something. When you fire RT to take down a strategical target like a factory or an ammo dump or something, there is absolutely no point to having uh, aircraft, tanks and infantry all supporting it, because they won't have anything to do but scatter once counter-battery fire arrives. This excuse that the HIMARS is an ineffective weapon because it was designed to operate in support of combined arms is frankly one of the weakest and possibly most bizarre arguments I've ever heard anyone state in regards to it. And, and, and I'm starting to genuinely question the capability for this person to actually speak on this subject matter. I mean, there's a former US artilleryman in the discussion, and I'm kind of I'm kind of looking at him to chime in and say, like, no, dude, artillery has long-term strategical uses, it's, it's not just a support weapon for attacks, you know? Uh, it's, um, it started raining again, so I apologize if you can hear that over the background. Um, let's, let's, I'm very, I'm contemplating opening the third bottle of wine. Let's carry on before I fucking pass out. And I would like to add uh, for a second that this is also what a lot of foreign volunteers have said about their experience in Ukraine, is that they felt like the underdog this time. Like a lot of them fought in the Middle East, but it was shocking to them that this time they don't have the firepower. They don't have all the medivac and all the good stuff that they had in the past. And a lot of them didn't like it, actually. Like, I'm not going to quote the entire article, but all the Ukrainian volunteers that, or say vol foreign volunteers to Ukraine that uh, I've spoken to or have been interviewed by uh, major press, major and minor press outlets actually, don't really seem to agree with this statement here. I'll leave a few links in the comments, you're, you're free to go read them yourself, they are fascinating readings. I'm wondering uh, which volunteers he is speaking because th there were quite a few shall we say, gun hole people who went there, like people who had no military experience but wanted to help out and had their own gun. And a lot of them uh, arrived thinking that they would just be support elements or they would be snipers or that they would be uh, back backroom medics and support staff. And like, they were they were shoved on the front lines and they were digging trenches and they, they were actively fighting Russians right from day one. And I, I know that surprised a lot of those people, but you know, that's because they didn't have any kind of concept of war to begin with you know <laughs> which is which is which is always going to happen in any war when you have green troops when you have troops there that that have no combat experience and have not been properly prepared i mean i mean there is a reason that especially this guy up here mr new atlas should know this because he was a former marine he should know that one of the things they do in the marines is they put you in a field and they blow up the field around you they have machine gun firing over your head because that is a fucking terrifying experience that will make you wet your fucking pants and unless you get over that urge to get out of the trench and run, you will never survive combat. As much as we want to make fun of these people for being arrogant, stupid little shits who, who thought they could just sit behind a barrel and camp the Russian army with impunity, you know, it's like fucking Call of Duty, you know? <laughs> It's, it's the fact that they are actually in the trenches, standing their fucking grounds, fighting day after day after day, that's admirable. And I, I admire people who have who have gone out and done that because as I do like to remind people all the time who do make fun of these people, they are out there. You're not. And it's it's very easy to judge people like that when you're sitting in your, your quiet air-conditioned suburban home and you're not in a fucking muddy trench outside Kharkov. They didn't like it actually. It's almost like the Russians have a completely modern army and they're it's very formidable. 
The modernization of Russia's military began in 2014. Prior to this, UK intelligence estimated that around 10% of Russia's military was to a modern standard, the rest being a combination of conscripts and poorly motivated, poorly trained recruits using older Soviet-era equipment. The modernization program was designed to increase this to around 40% and was set to be finished in 2024. The army was pegged to have around 2,300 of the newer T-14 type tank models, yet less than 20 currently exist. The same can be said of the Su-75 Femboy, with 55 supposed to now be in service but only two prototypes currently exist. Both of these projects fell into severe development hell, with lack of funds, corruption within the planning process, and a general lack of industry and expertise blamed for their continued delay. As a result, the Russian army was forced to fall back on upgraded versions of older Soviet vehicles, such as the T-80U and the T-90M, both of which rely on Western components to complete these upgrades, that do little to negate the problems with their current protection systems, such as explosive reactive armour, iron dazzlers and the so-called cope cages, all of which were outdated decades ago as concepts and have proven to be largely ineffective against the more modern and even outdated NATO anti-tank equipment, the same equipment that these tanks were designed to fight. To put that in comparison, the British reservists train and operate the Challenger 2, one of the most powerful NATO tanks currently in service that has only recently started to show its age. To put these reservists in the same comparable vehicles as Russian frontline modern and formidable troops, they would need to be equipped with the Vickers Mark III, a tank from the 60s upgraded to fight tanks from the 70s, to which, according to its primary user Kenya, is actually a considerably more rugged and reliable tank than the T-72, a tank supposedly its superior that is still in use by the Russian armed forces by some of its more elite units such as the 4th Guards Armoured, which is one of the most modern, best equipped, best trained and most experienced. The most modern and elite of Russian troops, the VDV, which includes the Spetsnaz, the supposed equal to the SES, have almost entirely been wiped out. The 1st Guards Armoured, Russia's best armoured division, is now down to 100 men who have remained on the Russian side of the border since pulling back from Kiev. The 4th Guards Armoured, the 3rd Guards Motorized, reportedly both have casualty rates of 50%. The 74th Separate Guards Motor Rifle Brigade, who attempted to cross the Dontex River back in May, suffered a nearly 90% casualty rate and lost 80 of their armoured vehicles in one battle. So modern? Not yet. Formidable? In comparison to Syrian rebels, yes. In comparison to a modern, well-equipped, well-dug-in army, no. And I, I mean, I've pointed this out on many occasions, is the the stuff that we're giving the Rus the, uh, the Ukrainians, even even the really high-level stuff we're giving the Ukrainians, like, you know, HIMARS, uh, MLRS systems, those are, I mean, and, and those are universally really just reconstitution of capability they they've lost earlier in the war i mean it's not like the the ukrainians didn't have some very formidable uh, soviet mlrs systems or um you know their own post-soviet developments of uh i mean of uh, mlrs systems um for instance uh the the smirch system which the ukrainians had a number of uh pre-war and they i think most of those have been destroyed by now but that's that's a more capable system than the time mars uh what? The Smirch is a good system. For the 90s, maybe. Uh, but its primary purpose was to fire a large number of missiles onto one target, and then retreat. The HIMARS can do the same, but it has the option to fire at multiple targets and hit very precise locations. It was built for an age when every dictator on the planet that America wants to fight would put large strategical targets in the middle of cities. So when America hits these sites, they can film all the dead civilians that lived around it and go, Ooh, isn't America bad? Ooh. This is where my expertise start to come in. See, uh, a lot of people know this by now, some of you may not. I used to work for British military intelligence. Nothing fancy, I wasn't a double O agent or whatever. My job was to predict civilian response to hypothetical scenarios. If you have an ammo dump or a fuel dump in the middle of a city surrounded by civilians, you cannot blow it up, or you end up with hundreds of dead civilians. So you have to find ways of putting that facility out of action, which is why you hit the roads leading into it, you hit the pumps, you hit the trucks, all things that can disable a facility without blowing up its contents. That's the strength of the HIMAR system. It can perform these pinpoint precision strikes very cheaply, and Russia agrees, considering they're replacing their highly advanced and capable smirch system with something called the Tornado, which operates on the 
same principle. Another major advantage of the HIMARS of the Smirch is it can be reloaded in the field very quickly. We're talking in minutes. The Smirch has to retreat, it has to go to a place with special vehicles. Uh, it can take about 40 minutes to reload one of these things. You can reload the HIMARS with a fucking forklift. The Ukrainians still have and still operate the Smirch. I, I don't know where they're getting this idea that, that they've all been destroyed by now. I mean, I mean, the charity SignMyRocket.com will happily write your name and a message onto one of the Smirch rockets before they fire it. Considerably so. And... Uh, wait, so, wait, so Tyler, sorry to interrupt. Uh, let, let, me, let me get this straight. The uh, multiple launch rocket systems that they had before were more capable than the HIMARS that they're deploying now? Uh, yes, actually, one, one specific system, uh, the uh, BM-30 Smirch, uh, that's a, a larger and larger, longer ranged and more generally more capable system than, than uh, US MLRS. Um, and uh, it's uh, been, now most of those systems have since been destroyed, but I mean, in a lot of senses, what we're what we're doing with a lot of this military aid is we're just reconstituting capability the Ukrainians had earlier and they lost. But um, Tyler, so I, I have a question. From what I read online, some people said that um, the, the advantage of the HIMARS is that they can be reloaded faster within five minutes. You just put the box, you remove the box, and you put a new one. Whereas the merge takes longer. This is from what I read. You get a fucking gold star. History of Legends may actually redeem himself here. He may actually know what he's talking about. <laughs> oh, fuck me. That, uh, I'm not actually super familiar with how, how fast you can reload a high bars, but if you look at the- If you don't know how long it takes to reload an artillery system, then you are unfamiliar with that artillery system, which means you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. The tactics they're using they're not they're not reloading those things and trying to shoot them rapidly they're they're reloading them deep in the rear um so they'll, they'll drive out to a firing point you know maybe 50 60 miles and then they'll they'll fire them they'll unload them then they'll they'll immediately speed off so they're, they're not trying to you know rapidly run pods through them so it's basically shoot and scoot because their counter battery fire is so effective that if they stay in one position very long, they'll just be incinerated, right? Uh, oh yeah, because I mean, you see a rocket launcher that size; it, it, it fires off. It's not only, I mean, not only can you, tra I mean, not only can the uh, can those projectiles be tracked with like a counter battery radar, but also it's a giant rocket launch. Um, so any <laughs> anybody who's looking out across the battlefield can see this thing fire. Um, that's that's going to attract a lot of attention because it's a very high value target. At, at what range, more or less, could you see such a such a launcher? I mean, you could see that as as far as visibility goes. So, I mean, if you're out on out, you know, say north of Kherson, and you know, there's 20 mile visibility. I mean, it's a it's a large smoke trail going off in the distance. You could uh, anyone with optics can can immediately see that. And uh, all right, the challenge for you kids is to pinpoint the exact location of a truck 20 miles away within the few minutes that it would take to drive away. Can you do that? Probably start calling fire on them immediately. Yes, because as we all know, every single Russian on the battlefield has memorized the grid coordinates and grid references of the entirety of Ukraine to the point where if they see a truck 50 miles away, because remember he said these things drive within 50 miles of their targets and then fire, they can see that truck with just regular optics and know exactly where it is, know the exact reference grid to call in a precision artillery strike immediately. I'm going to be skipping the rest of what this guy says because he literally just treads over the same fucking ground that he just said earlier. I'm letting him talk the most because, quite frankly, he doesn't actually say anything. He just kind of constantly repeats himself and then just goes over what everyone else has said and says, Yeah, I agree, because, uh... And then, like, refuses to fucking elaborate because, um... Like, it... As I've said before, I think I've said before, the entire video is in, linked to the description. You can free to go and watch it yourself uh, without my comments, without my judgment, and judge for yourself if that's what you want to do. Uh, I, I want to step back a little bit, you know, um, because it, this is the thing. Everybody says that that uh, um, 
the Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian armed force were 600,000 men at the beginning, but this included everybody, you know, a territorial defense force, cops, border patrol, everyone. And, uh, but the actual uh, combat army, I do believe was a number that I kept hearing was 230,000. And that the Russians essentially went in with an expeditionary force of 190,000 spread over essentially six fronts. There was the, the Kiev front, uh, Chuhuyev, Sumy, Kharkov, the Donbass, but that was supported by also the, the um, DPR and LPR uh, uh, forces, and Kursov, right? How is it possible that this essentially expeditionary force six months later or five months later is so, you know, categorically winning this war. He thinks Russia's winning the war. Gonzalo Rila thinks Russia is winning the war. There's a lot to unpack here. Primarily, he thinks Russia's winning the war. <laughs> and that does not go on to explain how he has come to this miraculous conclusion that Russia is somehow winning this war. <laughs> okay, but he does ask everyone else that question, you know, why is this? And if any of them don't immediately bitch slap him down with the full force of logic, which is that that is a very subjective opinion, then I might have to force open the fifth emergency bottle of wine and drink it with the fourth one! But let's, let's let the others explain. Let's, let's give everyone a chance to speak. Because I want to go over what he said earlier. Because he got pretty much all of the numbers wrong. I don't know where he got that 600,000 from. Um, actually, you know what? Give me a second, dear. Okay, the 600,000 number is a quote from the blog Seymour Rocks, who is also trying to highlight to me the dangers of chemtrails, who is quoting Scott Ritter, a former Marine Corps intelligence officer who has been arrested twice for sexual harassment of a minor, and is an avid supporter and contributor of da 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 Russia Today. He was one of the main spreaders of the fake BBC news footage claiming Ukraine was responsible for the massacres of civilians in Bukya. Not exactly the most credible source. So for the benefit of everyone here, Ukraine's army at the start of this conflict was about 200,000 armed personnel, uh, roughly 50,000 non-combatives, that's anyone from a medic to a civil servant who works at the Ministry of Defence, and about 60,000 National Guard units. That gives us a rough total of 260,000 combat-capable personnel. Russia has 1.3 million soldiers in active service, of which roughly 500,000 are non-combatives. This includes medics, officers, high-ranking generals, uh, various ceremonial positions, technicians, war planners, members of Russia's intelligence agency, the NOT KGB, uh, the mechanics and guards of the Komplinka Tank Museum, leaving us with about 850,000. Out of those 850,000, 250,000 are paramilitary. This includes military police, border guards, gulag prison guards, customs officers, etc, etc, and another 250,000 are reservists. These range from conscripts to soldiers that have been retired but can be recalled by the state if necessary. That leaves us with 350 actual combat-ready soldiers. 180,000 of these soldiers were earmarked for the Ukrainian invasion, and by the 8th of March, the Pentagon and the CIA reported that 100% of these forces had been deployed. As of the 11th of June, this number has grown to 330,000. 80,000 are reservists, and 70,000 are from non-combat roles that have been pushed into frontline service. This number does not include conscripts that have been brought into Philip ranks, militia groups such as the DNR, foreign volunteer groups such as Chechnya and Syria, or the Wagner Group. So no, Mr. Lira 11, I think you'll find that Russia greatly outnumbers Ukraine, not the other way around. But let's see what everyone else has to say. You know, we could be surprised here. I've already given it one gold star. Can I give it a second? Let's 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 find out. Uh, I'll throw this out to the three of you. But if you want, Brian, if you have any ideas, because I'm really trying to get a grip on how this happened that they're so clearly winning. I, I'm not really sure. How, you know, when the conflict started, how many you know how many soldiers were on both sides. Okay, if you don't know a fact that is so easily Googled, because both sides regularly reported their army numbers to the UN each year prior to the war, while having the audacity to earlier say you've been reading the US Congress transcripts about the HIMARS, then you're either a shit journalist or you're being willfully ignorant. Which one is it? Started how many, 
you know, how many soldiers were on both sides. Uh, I've seen a lot of different numbers that that could very well be the case. Ah, uh, yes, this argument. Oh, there's been a lot of conflicting data sources. We might never know the, the real answer. I've, I've, I've had so many different things from so many different people. <laughs> that is the dying calls of someone who has realized that what they believed was wrong and is now having to admit it, but doesn't have the fucking balls to do it. This fucker knows that the 600,000 number is wrong. He fucking knows. He's smart enough to read the UN reports and the fucking Ministry of Defense of Ukraine's official website and know exactly what the number is. But he's not ready to admit that in his mind, Russian propaganda, weirdo conspiracy theorists, the UN and a fucking child rapist are all equal levels of credibility. I'm going to let him talk for a few minutes and then I'm going to cut him off because I've listened to what he says on this subject matter prior to me recording uh, this. Everything he is about to say is completely, unequivocally bullshit. I, w I want you to listen to it and I'll wait to the end and then explain, all right? Uh, but, but what's for certain, Ukraine started the conflict out that was the strongest their army was going to be. That was the result of seven to eight years of U.S. and uh, other NATO countries coming in and training them, equipping them, sending arms in. Uh, that whole time they were building these fortifications along the line of contact, the Donbas region, and Russia is still advancing. They're, they're advancing against that army when it was at its height, and they are crossing the most heavily defended part of Ukraine right now, they're still advancing. They, they, Ukraine has been unable to stop them. So at this point, however many soldiers they started this out with, at this point, uh, that they're, you know, the best trained soldiers that they had, they're gone. And that's going to be very hard to re replace. You can't just replace officers and NCOs quickly. You, that's not something you can make in a factory and ship over. That takes time to do. So that they're, they're talking about finding a, a number of soldiers for a brigade and the equipment for a brigade. And they think they're going to stand that up and send it into battle. But, it, you know, to actually stand up a real brigade that can operate efficiently, that, that takes a lot more. Uh, that is something that they really can't do right now in the middle of a war. And all of that preparation over the last eight years, that was done under relatively ideal conditions. There, there's nowhere in Ukraine that you're going to be training large numbers of soldiers and then sending them into battle without or Russia sending cruise missiles. I think it was a technological edge that that Russia had. Uh, they they prepared for it well. And I, that's that's what I think. I think it was, you know, they've got a coherent army. I think it was under underestimated by by the US and, and by Ukraine. And I I think that was a contributing factor at least. Yeah, because I'm, I'm... I'm out of wine. I'm on to the apple schnapps now. Great fun. All right, let's take these one at a time. Ukraine started the conflict out. That was the strongest their army was going to be. That Yes, because when the US entered the Second World War, that was the strongest their army was ever going to be in that war. Oh, honey. Oh, honey, no. No result of seven to eight years of U.S. and uh, other NATO countries coming in and training them. They also brought in Red Army veterans who had fought in the Afghanistan war to train Ukrainian soldiers. Casually, they forget about that. Uh, this idea that Ukraine is a NATO standard army with NATO equipment and NATO trained has been a PR line pumped out by Russian state media since day one. The understanding is if they can claim victory over such an army, then NATO no longer remains a threat in their eyes. Of course, Ukraine is not up to a NATO standard. In 2014, during the first Russian invasion, Ukraine had about 7,000 soldiers who were fully combat ready and about a dozen tanks. They went from that to a highly trained, highly motivated army of 200,000 in eight years. That's impressive. To explain how this was achieved would be a video in in itself, not just a drunk ass reply to someone who should fucking know better. But the reality was it was Ukraine that did that, not NATO. It was their officer court reforms, it was their intense training, it was their promotion through ranks, etc, etc, that made them the army they are today. The US training helped, certainly. The joint exercises they did with Poland also helped. But this is not a NATO army. This is a Ukraine 
army, Ukraine trained, Ukraine equipped, with tanks that are a little more than an upgraded version of old Soviet models. Like, I'll leave a link in the description to an article by someone who was actually out there training Ukrainian soldiers. They can explain it way better than I can, um, and a lot more soberly than I can. <laughs> whole time they were building these fortifications along the line of contact. Fortification? What fortifications? This isn't World War II. They weren't rebuilding the fucking Maginot Line. A fortification in a modern day literally just means some sandbags in a fucking trench. And Russia is still advancing. Are, are, are we watching the same war here? I mean, for fuck's sake, at the time of recording, which is just a few days after this went live, Russia had ended its operational pause in the 14th, well, officially the 14th, actually the 16th, and it launched a number of offences along the front line, none of which had made any fucking progress. And then they got hit square in the jaw by this massive fucking Ukrainian counterattack. This counterattack has been focusing on Kherson and Kharkiv, two sectors under very different Russian operations operational commanders who have been, according to Ukrainian intelligence, bickering with each other quite a lot. And, and in fact, the only reason that they have two separate commanders here and not a single commander in overall operational command is because allegedly one of them threw a fucking temper tantrum when they tried to appoint the other one as overall commander. This is also the two sectors where the Ukrainian Hamras have been, you know, I'm saying that word wrong, but fucking rocket artillery, have been the most effective at taking out Russian ammunition dumps and heavy artillery. Meaning Russia cannot simply just summon the artillery, the god of war, to fix all its fucking problems, and now has to decide if it wants to defend Kherson, a city where, you know, citizens were issued Russian passports and were told Ukraine no longer exists, and defending its own border along the Kharkiv region. If Kherson falls, by, you know, by which the time this video actually goes out, it may have it may have already fallen, given the speed of Ukraine's advance, that puts Odessa off the map in terms of Russian territorial prospects, an objective which has been listed as a 1st of August deadline objective, and also threatens Crimea, and there has been increasing talk among the more independent of Russian media that it should be abandoned as a goodwill gesture. I mean, I mean, I don't think they will, Crimea is too valuable and very easily defendable, but its only supply chain is this very long, very vulnerable bridge and Ukraine have proven they are very good at taking out bridges, and if they do, that will mean every Russian soldier within that Crimea region now cannot escape, and that is going, that's, that's going to lose Russia an army. I'm trying to understand uh, that you're right, you know, uh, Donald Rumsfeld famously said that you go to a war with the army that you got. Ah uh, yes, because famously... <laughs> The U.S. finished World War II with the same army it fucking started the war. What are you talking about? And, and as a realistic, as, as a practical matter, there is simply no way to replace the men who have been lost. It, it takes months, years, in, in the case of NCOs, to replace them. So you can forget about that. Is that why Russia's replacing all of theirs after a month of training, yeah? Yeah. And so it seems to me that the, the way the Russians are just winning, it's inevitable. Is it inevitable? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe Russia is inevitable and it will one day rule the world. Somehow, I don't think so. I think what we've learned so far is that the host and Mr. New Atlas don't know a fucking thing about A, reality, or B, what the fuck is actually going on in Ukraine. They seem to exclusively get their information from Russian propaganda, conspiracy theorists, and fucking weirdo-ass fucking blogs. Literally enough, these two same people were claiming that Russia would split the country, and the country of Ukraine, in half back in March. And that didn't happen, and yet, and yet according to them, Russia is inequivocally winning undeniably winning as it's getting pushed back further and further and further out of strategical actually important objectives because it was concentrating all of its forces on capturing these fucking propaganda targets so it can pretend to its own fucking people that it's winning and, and these fuckers just lap it up and it, it, if you want, if, if you're looking for an investigative journalist, this is not an investigative journalist. This is a man who reads Russian propaganda and then tells you what he's read. 
it's 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 like when you watch fucking what's this called a Count Dankula video, and he's doing like his opinion piece on politics, and he's literally just reading off of a fucking like Daily Star article. That that's not journalism. That that that's 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 a newspaper reading. He's reading it to you. It's it's that's that's what this fucker is. The other two. The one on the left, uh, the Twitter user, the bane of non-credible, non-credible defense, fucking hate this guy. He's, he's brought up all the fucking time. I was expecting the worst out of this guy. So far, he hasn't actually fucking said anything. He's got one opinion that he's repeated three times. And that opinion is that if you are in New York, standing on top of the Empire State Building, and you look northeast to the town, to the, to the small town of Washington, which is about 50 miles away, you should be able to very clearly see a truck parked there because it's on fire and be able to call artil an artillery strike onto it. This man apparently was an artilleryman and he doesn't seem to know how artillery works. He has not sat there on a radio, cradling his head in his hands, biting his own nails as a fucking squaddy of recruits has attempted to call it an artillery strike on something they think they can see, but don't really know where it is. Yeah, it's about northwest of our position. Cool, what's your position? Uh, hang on, let me check. Dave, you got the map? The map? Yeah. What is, where does it say we are? Uh, I don't know. Is it the numbers? What do the numbers say? Uh, I don't know, Mine, mine's not turned on. Turn it on, what does it say? Uh, uh, it takes a minute, hang on. Where, where are we on this map? I don't know, you're the one with the map. Where are we? I fucking don't know. All right, they're north of 4562. Okay, how far north? Uh, what did you say, a couple of miles? Couple of miles, couple of miles. Uh, okay, we're reading a uh, civilian village up there. You you sure that's a target? Hey, Dad, he says it's a civilian village up there. What? He says it's a civilian village. Yeah, it is. Is that where they are? No, they're just in front of the village. No, they're just in front of the village. Just aim in front of the village. I, I can't, I, I, need, I, I need coordinates. That's, that's not how it works. You know, he's never, he's never fucking had that experience. <laughs> it's just, but, you know, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt because I've not really heard him speak. He's yet to speak on why Russia is winning the war. The other guy I've given a gold star to, he has yet to speak on why Russia is winning the war. Let us, which is because we are, because we are gentlemen, because we are kind and we are courteous. We will let them speak and we'll see if they can impress us. This is not a Billy stream. This is a very, very drunk stream. My neighbors are already complaining about me shouting. And so, Alex, what what do you say? Yeah, I'm, it's interesting because I read some reports about the battles that took place in Donbass in 2014 and 2015. And it was very interesting to read because if you just change the, the names of units and, and villages, the same comments were made in 2015 as now. And this is what shocked me. I'm like, hold on, wasn't there eight seven eight years of nato training no it just turns out that we get a repeat of the previous guy's point a regurgitation of the same pr line spewed out by russia today this is a nato army it was trained by the us and nato for eight years therefore if we can win or at least claim we're winning then we proud strong russians can beat nato just like we always claimed we could all hail putin your democratically elected president for life the suit is worth more than your home and almost all of your fucking possessions. Ignore that we are engaged in a cold political war with China as we each try to pretend to be each other's friends for the propaganda cameras, but really we are fighting over resources in Africa. Ignore that we are literally looting scrap metal from Ukraine and liquidizing the assets of Putin's political opponents to pay for new recruits. Just think of the Soviet Union. Remember the Soviet Union. Remember when we were a mighty empire? Yeah, that was great. So I still think at the end of the day, the Ukrainian army is still a Soviet army with a NATO hat. At, at its core, the way they function was still very Soviet, very Russian too. Like the, the same army is just clashing. 
Part of the major reforms to the Ukrainian army over the past eight years was something Ukraine called decommunization. It changed its uniforms, it got rid of all the Soviet imagery, the title of guards and major divisions. It began to go through its older equipment, decommissioning anything that couldn't be upgraded. But most importantly, it reformed its officer corps. It would raise new officers through the ranks rather than through specialized training giving out to those in favor that had been the way under Soviet rule. It would also radically reform its tactical doctrine, its logistics, its artillery and support branches. It would even implement new training programs for civilian militias and the National Guard that more closely resembled Western NATO training. To even start to call them a Soviet army is a level of ignorance so deep. To come to that conclusion, one would have to be so completely unaware of not only the previous eight years of Ukraine military reform, but what a Soviet army actually is to begin with. The Russian army today more closely resembles that of the Soviet-style tactics that we are familiar with, and that they went into Ukraine like it was the fucking Fulda Gap, using the very much the same invasion plans that they had prepared for West Germany. Armoured divisions using tanks and mounted infantry beginning thunder runs towards key targets, linking up with paratroopers and helicopter mounted infantry which had been sent ahead to capture airfields with smaller militias and motorised divisions and foreign volunteer groups like the Chechens moving in to distract or ambush any organised resistance. Key to these plans would be that any Thunder Run would have exactly 48 hours of supply in order to facilitate the best possible speed and would have to capture their objectives before resupply was possible. This is exactly how the invasion of Ukraine went about and why it didn't fucking work. When you see the problems in 2015, the Ukrainians face the same exact problems nowadays. Can you be specific, please? For example, in modern propaganda, there is a tactic that you've probably encountered yourself many times called controlled critique. And this is when, you know, during a casual discussion on whatever, one of the presenters asks the question to the main speaker that would, on the surface at least, seem to be a form of critique, but in reality is just an excuse to deluge into the PR line that has been prepared for anyone who would ask this obvious question. We're hoping that one of the children might pop up with a question about the upcoming election. Little girl, do you think you can memorize? this by dinner time tomorrow? Mr. Burns, your campaign seems to have the momentum of a runaway freight train. Why are you so popular? Very good. Mm. The PR line is stated and the critique is silenced. Satisfied that their concern has been answered and no further follow-up questions are required. To give you an example, our cigarettes are toasted, making them some of the finest cigarettes in America. Ah, but Mr. Johnson, sir, I did read in the newspaper that cigarettes can give you cancer. I wouldn't believe a word of that. Newspapers today are corporations just like any other. They will print any old thing just to scare you into buying them. They care more about their profit margin than your health. Our cigarettes are the best in America and that is the bottom line. I'm not saying that this is what these people are doing, but every time they do this little interruption like this, this is exactly what I'm hearing at the back of my mind. They were talking about a withdrawal. And there was a battle, Debaltsev, in February 2015. And it was a cauldron type of operation where the Russians encircled a Ukrainian force and the Ukrainians... Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip this part because he just waffles on and on and on about this encirclement and the, and the sank or whatever. Uh, to briefly explain, it was an attempt to encircle and destroy a large part of the Ukrainian army. It didn't work, but then a video later emerged of Ukrainian troops. I'll show it here. Uh, three soldiers, a little out of breath, carrying a heavy machine gun. Because of this video, Russia Today, Sputnik, Eurasia Times, you know, the usual suspects, all used this as evidence that the retreat was completely chaotic and then and later storage emerged that these troops have been abandoned or left to die, etc, etc, etc. Also, the other thing they mentioned in 2015 is that the Ukraine government would often lowball the amount of casualties. For example, they would say, yeah, we got that many KIA and that many wounded. However, they would say, yeah, but that only includes the, the, the soldiers from the armed forces of Ukraine. Doesn't count, doesn't take into account all the volunteer battalions. So you could multiply that number of losses multiple times. Ukraine have actually been very forthcoming with their casualties, and in fact they've been accused of inflating their casualty numbers to garner sympathy from the West. Russia, however, have not. Russia will admit to about 5,000 casualties. UK intelligence estimates it's actually closer to 50,000 casualties. The Pentagon thinks it's closer to 70,000 casualties. 
If we use the same logic as history legends and multiply that by many, many times, a comfortable medium is around 55 to 60,000 casualties. To put that in perspective, that is more losses than the US took in both Iraq theatres. It's more losses than all sides took during D-Day. 55,000 losses in five months of war is more losses than the US took in 20 years of Vietnam. And yet Captain Chucklefuck here thinks that Russia is winning. Tyler? And finally, we have Tyler. And Tyler, I'll remind you, is a former artilleryman who does not know how artillery works, does not know the difference between strategical strikes and tactical strikes that artillery would typically be used for under certain circumstances, and thinks if visibility that day is 50 miles, then you should be able to easily spot something as small as a truck from 50 miles away. His single claim to fame is that he has a Twitter account. Tyler is going to give us a rundown of how he thinks the war is going. He does ramble on a bit, so I'm going to cut out a lot of the bits where he repeats himself, or just agrees and goes over with what the others have already said. Take it away, Tyler. Oh, I mean, I'd say the the source of the Russian advantage in this war has been uh, a couple of things. Um, first of all, the uh, I'd say a lot of it has to come down to, um, I mean, first of all, the Russians have clearly have a quite well-trained and well-prepared army. A huge part of Russia's lackluster performance in the early part of this war, including its failed attempts to capture Kiev, has been blamed on Russia's lack of preparation. According to a leaked letter from the Kremlin, Russian intelligence agencies and war planners were told that the Ukrainian invasion was a hypothetical thought experiment, and that a positive outcome would be politically beneficial. So plans that were made were built entirely on the idea that the West would not intervene, that Ukrainian forces would lay down their arms, and that the population of Ukraine would welcome their Russian liberators. However, Russian generals seemed to act as if these plans were genuine and prepared accordingly. The first wave of Russian troops were very lightly trained, young and lacking supply for a prolonged campaign. And Putin agrees. He's been very forthcoming in placing the blame on all of Russia's military failures squarely on its generals and their lack of preparation. This is a narrative that has been parroted by the pro-Russian military bloggers and even by the Russian people themselves. When Tyler says that the Russian army was well prepared and well organised, he is not reading from Russian propaganda that has spoon-fed him this narrative. He is straight up lying. And so what that's telling me is their, their operational readiness rate has probably gone from, you know, 40 or 50 percent to 80 or 90 percent as far as, you know, having all their equipment and all their equipment works. Again, a huge part of Russia's early failures was that its advanced equipment did not work, either through lack of maintenance, as we saw with the Panzer S1, or because its capabilities as a system had been greatly overhyped, as we saw with the Buck and the S400s. Systems that were designed to take down drones and aircraft, and were being blown up by drones and aircraft. And the Russians have... Um, they have deployed a lot of older stuff, but it's generally been pretty well modernized older stuff, and they have a lot of, and they have um, generally a newer generation of equipment, and their units are more complete in the sense that they they have they're more they're better filled out with newer with you know, newer generation equipment. This is again objectively not true. Almost everything Russia is currently using dates from the fucking Soviet era, which ended 31 years ago, and has been upgraded to the standards of the fucking 90s. Yes, they have newer, modern stuff that was due to replace all of that, things like the T-14 and the Su-75 projects, or even the new AK-15 battle rifle, have all been hampered by long production delays, which means that Russia has had to fall back on upgrading older stuff, or issuing what it had in storage and hoping for the fucking best. And in many cases, an example being the T-90 main battle tank, these upgrades relied on western parts, all of which are suddenly not available, meaning that once the T-90M is lost, you can't replace it. It's gone. Also, again, they have they have deep strike weapons that can hit, you know, easily hit the Polish-Ukraine border they have. Which they have been exclusively using to target civilians and have now run out of, to the point where they were firing anti-ship missiles at civilian targets. But if they can hit the Polish border, then please, hit the Polish border. The Poles would love nothing more. Plus they have air superiority and have had that since day one. What? What? No, they haven't. What fucking planet are you looking at? 
Their early deep strike missiles and artillery did not take out Ukrainian radar stations, anti-air systems or aircraft. The Ukrainian Air Force is very much still intact and regularly makes airstrikes. Russia does not have air superiority. If they did, they wouldn't be having such a major problem with drones. They wouldn't have been forced to rush all their anti-air defenses to the fucking front lines. They wouldn't be hiding behind giant artillery screens. <sighs> Like, I think at this point it has become somewhat obvious that this man has no fucking idea what he is talking about. So far, all he has done is repeat other people's opinions, and now he's had the opportunity to talk about what he knows, he has proved he knows absolutely nothing. He's parroting the propaganda lines he's picked up from the others, and the rest of the time he is just literally making it up as he goes along. He doesn't have a fucking clue what is going on in Ukraine, or even what's going on in Russia. And honestly, I'm not going to waste time on this anymore. Like, this video is over an hour long and we are barely half an hour into this two hour long podcast. I don't have the energy or the alcohol or the ability to drink the amount of alcohol that I would need to consume to produce a five hour long video debunking all the dumb shit these people say. I think I've proved my point multiple times now. These people do not know what they are talking about. At best, they have a surface level knowledge that, that I'd expect of an office worker discussing deeply complicated political events around the water cooler, their opinion based entirely on last night's news report. There has been absolutely no discussion between them all. All they have done is cut between each other to deliver a ham-fisted opinion on a topic that is quite literally just a PR narrative from a Russian propaganda channel. You can go download a VPN and just watch Russia Today now. You don't need these people to tell you what it said. New Atlas up there, the fact that he calls himself a journalist when he has clearly done no research and is blatantly prepared to ignore facts if they disagree with him is quite frankly laughable. Maybe this is not his subject. Maybe, maybe, maybe where his strength lies is in the geopolitical situations in Asia. Maybe if I watched his stuff on Asia and on the political situation over there, I would be more impressed by what he has to say. If you're familiar with this man's work, do let me know in the comments if you think I'm being unfair. The other guy down here, Armchair Warlord, shouldn't even be on this fucking podcast. He clearly knows absolutely nothing. He doesn't even seem to understand the basics. He doesn't even know the propaganda lines. He's literally just bumbling his way through this fucking podcast, and the only reason he has any notoriety is because non-credible defense think he's a lol cow and like to poke him for fun. I've heard more sane takes from fucking Mike Sparks. This guy is a whole level lower than fucking Mike Sparks. That should tell you everything. History of Legends, look, look, he seems smart. He seems reasonable. His videos can be entertaining, but honestly, he is following the propaganda narrative and he is grasping at straws to construct arguments. I want to say he's a good guy, but he's not. He has an agenda, and that agenda has blinded him to what is right in front of him. Again, he's done very little research, and what little he has done is very skewed towards one side. Look, if you want to watch the whole video yourself, I'll leave a link in the description. I've been at this for a lot longer than I thought I would. This was meant to be a quick video that I'd launch on the same day as their discussion. It's taken me over a week to edit this down to an hour and 20 minutes or whatever it'll come out as. I don't, like, I don't know if Ukraine can actually win this or if it will go to the negotiating table and Russia will claim a frag victory. But I do know Russia is not winning and the chances of Russia winning decrease every day that this war goes on. I believe that full-heartedly. Okay, yeah, I was never in the military, especially for 11 years. I was in British military intelligence for five years. My job was to predict civilian response to hypothetical situations, so maybe I'm not the best person to judge. But I believe, maybe this is the wine talking, that I don't need to defend my opinions. I just need to wait. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But honestly, I don't think I am. And there are many, many experts, all with better minds than me or you or these four fucks, who'd agree. Anyway, I'm done with this. This was a terrible idea. I'm banning the person who suggested it. Uh, uh, good night. Go away.
In other words, put my hand. In other words, baby. Seven feet away at all times, please. I don't want you fucking COVID all over me. Fill my heart with song. Let me sing forevermore. Yeah. You are all I long for. All I wish you. In a drawer, in other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. <laughs> 